God. Amen. Amen. It's also good to have a good building to meet in. Amen. The house of God and the building are entirely two different things. The house of God's the church, folks. Amen. Amen. Father, bless the study of your word now and the time we have together in this few minutes. I pray, Lord, for wisdom. And Father, I pray that you'd write these things in our hearts. Give us that, give us that spirit of discernment so necessary. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> now, what I'm going to do this morning is uh, we've covered a lot of ground in here in the last, uh, say, six months, a year. We've covered a lot of stuff. Uh, I have a, uh, what you might say, like Reader's Digest. Uh, they, are, they have a uh, condensed, they condense things. And this is a condensation of, uh, of uh, a lot of material that's been covered. And it's set in the perspective of one man. I'm not saying that I agree with everything that he says, but I'm saying that's going to make you think. His name is uh, Paul McGuire. How many of you ever heard of him? Okay, a few of you have. Uh, He's going to tell you, he's, he, I'm going to, when I read this, you're going to see many similarities in the things that I've discussed in here in Sunday school. You're going to see many similarities. Then you're going to find this man putting this stuff together. Now I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not necessarily that I agree with everything that's said, but as I said to you before, and I'll say again many, 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 many times, debate is good. Debate is very good. It's always good to have two or three or four opposing sides, uh, perspectives, so you can compare them. And uh, there's nothing in the world wrong with that. And uh, uh, the preacher that says you have a right to be wrong, uh, he, needs to, uh, he needs to do some praying. Uh, that's an arrogant, one-sided attitude as if, uh, you know, I know it all, and, and if you ever come up to my level, then you'll know it all too. That's a horrible position to take. So just listen to what I read for you this morning and think on it because I'm going to break it down and I'm not going to try to read the whole thing in one reading. We'll go through it in sections. All right. Many people are confused, anxious, and t even terrified about what is coming in America. Perhaps the greatest source of fear is not knowing what is going to happen and people are tempted perhaps due to mind control, to surrender to fatalism. Nimrod was the creator of the Tower of Babel, which was the center of the first one world government, one world economic system, and one world religion. Nimrod was a Rephaim and possessed the DNA of a God-man. Now he uses God-man, not in the sense that there are many gods. In other words, Jehovah, the God of the Hebrew, and then Shiva, the god of the, of, the, of the Hindu, and so forth and so on. No. There's one true living God. But you need to remember that the word Elohim is a plural Hebrew noun which has been translated in the Old Testament either as God, Genesis 1-1, the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, or it is translated gods in reference to the angels, and so forth in the Old Testament. So he, he says it in that sense when he says God-men. So uh, Nimrod's the creator of Babel. Nimrod was a Rephim, possessed the DNA of a God-man which was produced by the interspecies breeding of fallen angels and human women which created the race of the Nephilim. Nimrod had superhuman intelligence and access to technology and science so advanced that modern science is just beginning to discover it. <laughs> Nothing that I read in that first chapter that I have a problem with whatsoever. They're finding all over this world cases where science as we know it today is only catching up with science as they knew it then. Bottom line is that the idea that we were all cavemen and, uh, you know, somehow or another Neanderthals uh, possessing an intelligence maybe of an IQ of about 50 or 60 and then it evolved into what we are today is a bunch of garbage. That's garbage. That's junk. That's for public consumption. During the invasion of Iraq, now listen carefully, American soldiers recaptured the ancient city of Babylon 
along with historical relics that may have contained ancient DNA going back to the Tower of Babel. Now this is going to be controversial what I read to you. Listen carefully. The American military and other major militaries around the world are aggressively interbreeding DNA to produce a transhumanist super soldier and they may find Nephilim DNA which would make it possible to create a race of God-men. This is what Adolf Hitler and the Nazis were using genetic science for in their effort to create a blonde-haired and blue-eyed master race. Nazi technology and science was deeply connected to legends of advanced beings who came from the stars and established a super race on the legendary island of Thule. According to the ancient Nordic religions, this race of supermen eventually established a new civilization under the earth called Hyperborea, where there was supposedly a burning black sun which generated a supernatural force called the Vril. I've talked about the Thule Society. I've talked about the Vril Society. I've talked about Operation High Jump that took place right after World War II, where Admiral uh, Richard Byrd, as you, how many were taught about Admiral Byrd in high school? Kids today don't have a clue who he is. That's such a shame because he was a real patriot and an explorer, but anyway, <laughs> they went to Antarctica, Operation High Jump, after World War II, ostensibly on the surface of, to go down there and do some, uh, do some uh, uh, scientific work, but the fact is they took a force with them, and they took an expeditionary force, and the idea was they thought maybe the Nazis had built a base in the Antarctica, and a lot of people to this very day believe that Hitler escaped and went into the Antarctica, into that base, and lived out his days there, and that they had connections there with occult power and forces. Now, Admiral Byrd in his diary, how many's ever heard of Ad Admiral Byrd's diary? How many's never heard of it? That's the best way. All right. Admiral Richard Byrd wrote a diary. Now, this is not in the stuff I'm reading this morning. This is what I've taught you before, but it's been some time. Admiral Richard Byrd wrote a diary about his trip to Antarctica, Operation High Jump. He commanded a task force of thousands of men, many ships, and they went to Antarctica after World War II. In his diary, he says that he encountered flying... Uh, I don't know what this terminology you use, some flying craft that could move at enormous speeds and that it greatly upset him to think that the United States may face that kind of power because it was beyond anything that the United States had in 1940, I forget a high jump, 45, 46, 47, somewhere in there. You can look it up. Just look up, look up Oper Operation High Jump when you get home and Google it. Admiral Byrd, Richard Byrd, and you'll see what I'm talking about. But anyway, the point is that, uh, that uh, this admiral, this seasoned, trained, intelligent, smart man, wrote in his diary that he, that he encountered this, that this and that it, and it greatly upset him. All right, now what's happening here is this is, this is, this is outside corroborating proof or let's say this uh, uh, corroborating... Uh, experience, witness to what I'm about to read for you this morning. Uh, how many of you in this house this morning believe firmly that what you read in the history books is for public consumption? All right. Our history teacher back there raised his hand too. <laughs> he teaches history and he knows better. Uh, he told me one day, standing back there in the foyer, that the American Indians, I forget which group it was, uh, wrote in their history on the walls or tradition, however it was passed on, that giants lived in the West at one time so big that they could pick up a buffalo and run with it. Let that settle in. Now either they've been smoking too much, eating too much weed, whatever it was that, the, that these Indians could get a hold of out there, or that happened. According to the scripture, there were giants in the earth in those days. 
I believe in giants. Yes. I got no problem believing an American Indian or whoever when he starts talking about giants. No problem at all. That's not an issue. That's a non-issue. I believe the Bible. But anyway, point is that you have an official version of history that is designed to mold the thinking of the people for a projected end, for desired goal. They want you to think a certain way. So uh, I'm, I'm saying all that to get into this because he's going to get into the founding of America. Uh, Paul McGuire. He's going to get into the founding of America. <laughs> he's going to get into the basis of what it was founded on, who founded it, uh, its purpose, why it was established, all that. Now, these are his views, but I'm not saying I agree 100% with him, but I'm not saying I disagree either with a lot of the things that he says. So let's listen to what the man says. He says that, and this, of course, with Adolf Hitler in Nazi Germany, you can, there's a, a multitude of material out there with uh, Thule Society, the Vril Society, the occult connection with the SS, and, uh, 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 the, uh, and, the, and, the, and, 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 and the advanced technology that the Nazis had. It's unbelievable how far advanced they were than so many other people in the world. Uh, Werner, Werner von Braun was brought to America along with a lot of other scientists from Germany, and he was very instrumental in helping us get a man on the moon. And he was a German uh, rocket scientist. So there's no question about that, the fact that they had a lot of advanced technological ability. It begs the question, where did that come from? The book of Daniel, chapter number 12, says knowledge shall increase. What we're reading here now, what this man is saying is that if you have a connection with fallen angels, supernatural powers, that you have a connection with high technology. You have a connection with advanced knowledge. Where does this advanced knowledge come from? It comes from above. They brought it down with them. And they're able to affect, the man, um, affect mankind. Now listen carefully. This is what Adolf Hitler and Nazis were using genetic science for in their effort to create a blonde-haired, blue-eyed master race. Nazi technology and science was deeply connected to legends of advanced beings who came from the stars and established a super race here on this earth. In attempting to predict the future of America, one must understand that the universe is currently involved in a great cosmic war between Lucifer and God. How many agree with that? Lucifer led a rebellion against God with one third of the angels, a revolution where he intended to violently overthrow the throne of God and become God himself. Large numbers of Lucifer's fallen angels fell to the earth. Ancient legends across the world point to these fallen angels as supermen or godmen who came from the stars with advanced technology, science, and supernatural powers. It was this race of godmen who built the great monolithic monuments before the flood and established the super civilizations like Atlantis that Plato talked about and Thule. What is perceived as their occult powers was a combination of supernatural powers and highly advanced scientific knowledge. Which of course would explain why you have these in Chile, is it Chile, Peru? The desert down there in South America where you can only, it makes these, 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 these uh, uh, carvings in the land and, and, and monuments lifted, these uh, rocks and formations and all of this make no sense unless you're up in the air. And you can look down upon it, and it's remarkable at, uh, at uh, Nazca. I think it's Nazca, Nazca, something like that. It's the, it's the plains down there in South America. It's either Peru or Chile. And it makes no sense unless you're up in the air. Now, folks, who was up in the air? Right. See? Yeah. You know, the Wright brothers, are, or the ones uh, they had balloons, of course. They used them in, in the Civil War. Balloons go back a long way, but as far as a powered aircraft, uh, the Wright brothers were the first ones who ever, uh, you know, that was, when was that, 19 and 2, 3, 4, somewhere in there. So in any event, uh, this, this battle is raging, and uh, this, uh, it was the race of godmen who built the great monolithic monuments before the flood and established the super civilizations like Atlantis and Thule, what is perceived as their occult powers, a combination of supernatural and highly advanced scientific knowledge. Mr. McGuire says, I write about this more extensively in my new book, A Prophecy of the Future of America. Now, 
How many of you in this house this morning feel like that this is a very relevant subject when we're talking about the future of America based on what the Supreme Court just did Friday? And the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court said, who do we think we are? John Roberts. That's what he said. Who do we think we are? Who do we think we are? The evidence of this can be seen in the founding of America, which occurred 1776, same year as the occult society, the Illuminati, the Illuminati was founded. Here we go, into the founding of America. Uh, according to Tom Horn, his book, Apollyon Rising, 2012, it may come as little surprise that then George W. Bush, in a speech before his second inaugural, said the United States had a, quote, calling from beyond the stars, unquote. The Freemasons used powerful occult symbols in the layout of Washington, D.C. Now that's fact. That's a fact. Which incorporated the goat of Mendes, the upside down pentagram of Bahomet, which is one of the most powerful symbols of Satanism, also, the owl figure embedded in the architectural layout represents the Masonic Illuminati owl featured at the Bohemian Grove ceremonies, which invokes the supernatural power of the gods Athene, Minerva, Lilith, and Astarte. Under the nation's capital, there are paintings of George Washington. Now, this will be very controversial to you, and I cannot prove this one way or another. I'm simply reading what the man says. I'm not saying I agree with this, but listen to what he says. Under the nation's capital, there are paintings of George Washington playing with these pagan gods and goddesses. These Washington, D.C. symbols, along with the phallic symbol of the Washington Monument and the womb of the Capitol Dome, and we've gone into detail about that before, go all the way back to ancient Babylon. These ancient occult symbols, along with the symbols on the Great Seal of the United States and the Illuminati symbolism on the back of the U.S. dollar, all point to the historical truth that powerful members of the occult secret society of the Rosicrucians, such as Sir Francis Bacon, plan for the United States to become the new Atlantis and the head of the New World Order. We're talking 300 years ago almost. This is why the occult pyramid, which represents the Great Pyramid of Giza, is on the dollar bill. This occult pyramid represents the Luciferian organizational structure with the illumined ones of the Illuminati as the secret elite who rule the world. They are represented above the all-seeing eye of Lucifer or the eye of Horus in a triangle. Below the all-seeing eye of Lucifer is the base of the pyramid, which represent the slaves of the New World Order, which would be people like you and me. At the bottom of the pyramid, the words novus, novus order seclorum, these are Latin words, which means new order of the ages or the new world order. That's on your dollar bill. This goes back to the legend of Atlantis where there was supposedly a great university which taught all the highly advanced knowledge of the arts, sciences, medicine, technology, supernatural power, and mathematics. At the top of a giant Atlantean pyramid was an astronomical observatory. When Nimrod built the Tower of Babel, its purpose was to worship the host of heaven in the stars which probably involved both literally worshiping the race of God-men who came from the stars and practicing the cult, the occult, and the science of astronomy. The bird on the dollar bill really represents not an eagle, but an occult phoenix. The word phoenix comes from the Phoenicians who supposedly lived around Mount Hermon, listen carefully, which was the location of an ancient stargate where a race called the Watchers, or gods, from the stars would descend to the earth. You remember it was a Caesarea Philippi. The Lord Jesus Christ says, Upon this rock I'll build my church. Gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Caesarea Philippi is where the waters of Mount Hermon come bubbling up out of the mountain. There's a huge hole right there that goes down deep into the heart of the earth. On the side of that mountain, is an alcove with an image of Pan. And it therefore became a 
they, as, this, as this man says and so many other have said, it was what's called a stargate or a gate, an opening. And the Lord Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell, you're looking at them right here, shall not prevail against it. Amen. Of course, that was a type because the gates of hell are not limited to Mount Hermon or Caesarea Philippi. The gates of hell can be found all over this world. When Jonah was swallowed up by that huge whale, did he not say in the book of Jonah, I think it's along about chapter number two, the gates and the bars, and he went down into hell. He went down into Sheol, the Old Testament. And of course, he became a type of Christ, for he spent three days and three nights there in the whale's belly, and the Lord even made reference to him and said, as Jonah was in the heart of the, was in, was in the belly of the whale for three days, three nights, so must the Son of Man be where? And so therefore the earth has a heart to it. It has a center section to it. There is far more in this earth than, than, than scientific geology would tell you. And I'm not trying to throw off on geologists. There's a lot of good Christian geologists out there. But sometimes people simplify things for their own purposes or twist them and pervert them to push their own agenda. Something happened in CERN, Switzerland just a few days ago. When they started up that Large Hadron Collider, and they're moving these objects, protons, at the speed of light, and they, and they, and they collide. And uh, Stephen Hawking warned that this could possibly destroy the universe as we know it. And he's uh, one of the most brilliant men in the country. He's a theoretical physicist. He wasn't some boy from Hay, Hay Boy Corner. He says you could destroy the universe as we know it. How do we know right now that that thing hasn't been releasing stuff into us? You talked about the spiritual thing. You remember I told you how that, that, this, that, that this connection could be that something happens there that has a direct connection with something 3,000 miles away. Uh, the dark matter and antimatter and all that. We talked about that at length. Uh, who knows how much of an effect that's had on the Supreme Court up here in Washington, D.C. And the point is this. He that letteth will let till he be taken out of the way, right? He's holding back. Yeah. He's keeping it back. Yeah. And then when he begins to gradually move back and say, oh, this is what you want, this is what you get. Right. Yeah. And the truth of the matter is, you get the kind of leadership that you deserve. Right. You get the kind of politicians that we deserve. We get that kind. Right. And uh, a Supreme Court Justice, Samuel Alito, sat in a a combined House and Senate, what they call it when the President speaks to, to, to the House and Senate, the joint session, that's it, a joint session. I watched those Supreme Court justices sit there and I watched Samuel Alito when Obama got up, in the, got up there and started talking and I watched that Supreme Court justice look at him and I, heard, I didn't hear him but I could see his mouth moving and he said something and some people say, he said, you're a liar. I don't know that that's what he said, but the bottom line is I don't think that justice has ever gone back and heard Obama say another word. Do you know if he has or not? I don't think he has. I don't think he has. Obama changed his position on sodomite marriage. Hillary Clinton changed her position on sodomite marriage. <coughs> Joel Osteen changed his position on sodomite marriage. Complete flip. Either, either, you, either your position is what you are or you're... Oh, the wind's blowing. This is where I am. The wind's blowing this way. I'm over here. Oh, it's changed. I'm over here. Whichever way the wind's blowing, that's where I am. So, say, so what do you believe, preacher? What, what do I believe today? <laughs> You know, I may change my mind next week. It just depends. The bottom line is, what does it take for me to prosper and survive? Yeah. Satan said in the book of Job, skin for skin. Yeah. Did you know that that's 99.9% .9 true? There is that small percentage who will go to a cross and die for the name of Jesus. Satan can't figure them out. But that figure fits most people. That's sad to say. But that's what's happened. So in any event, this bird, the worship of fallen angel, began with Babylon as a central part of the occult teachings that fits the establishment of America 
as the center of the New World Order. Apollo, Osiris, or Nimrod appears in code and the symbolism that is part of Washington, D.C., the Great Seal of the United States. There are numerous references to some kind of God King like Nimrod who will return from the past to rule the New World Order. And on he goes. Now, I'm not going to read everything he has to say. But I put enough out there this morning to make you think. Here's my question. I've been asked time and time and time and time again, Preacher, is America in Bible prophecy? Well, the word America is not going to show up in Bible prophecy. It's not going to show up. It's just not going to happen. But when you study the Bible, you'll find out that one nation can stand for another nation. And you'll, start, you'll find out that one person can stand for another person. And you'll find out that a prophecy can be partially fulfilled, but not filled full until later on. In other words, God has his own way of fulfilling his word, and he can do it any way he pleases. So what are you saying? I'm saying that I am not so certain that America is Babylon, but I wouldn't argue with you for a second. If you believe that, ba that America is Babylon... And that its purpose here in the last days is the Babylon of the book of Revelation chapter number 17. Uh, I'll listen to you. Are, you. are you listening to me? In plain words, America could very well be the seat of the new world order. And it could probably be the source of the Antichrist. And it is definitely has an Antichrist government in there right now. I mean, anybody, any Christian ought to know that. And we are, we are a nation that's lost our way. We've lost our way. Amen. It's so sad. But what I've seen happen in this country. 1964, they kicked prayer out of school. 1973, in Roe versus Wade, the Supreme Court ruled that a woman has a right over her body. I think I forget the terminology. And therefore, she can abort her child. 57 million babies have paid the price for that since then. 57 million. And now... In uh, what was the date of Friday? What's the date? Is it the 28th? 26th. June, uh, June the 26th, 2015, the U.S. Supreme Court has ruled that, that, that they, they use the word gay. Sodomite marriage is a constitutional right. It becomes a federal right, which means that no, not one of the 50 states of this union can deny uh, two people, two sodomites or lesbians if they want to get married. And so now they've ruled that's the law of the land. Now, where are we headed? I read a thing yesterday. This guy said, well, I don't, you know, they haven't gone far enough. I believe in plural marriages. And he said, if I want to have a harem, I ought to be able to have a harem. And who are you to tell me how to, what, a, what a marriage is and, and what a family is about? If, if two, if two uh, homos or gays can have a family and have a home, then why can't I? Why can't he? John Roberts says that if you, if, you, if you believe in sodomite marriage, I don't forget the term he used, gay marriage, he said you can rejoice or you can, you can be happy about this. And then he went on about this, that, this, that. Then he finally said this. John Roberts said this. But be certain of this one thing, that none of this is based on the Constitution of the United States. I'm glad he said that. He's the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. He said be certain of this, none of it. David Breyer, Anthony Kennedy... Uh, Elena Kagan, uh, what's her, Sotomayor, I don't remember her first name, and then, uh, and then uh, uh, the, the, the progressive liberal Jew, what's her name? Ginsburg. Ruth Bader Ginsburg. All right, these are the five right here. These are the five that voted to destroy the home and marriage as you understand it. Antonin Scalia, uh, the, uh, Clarence Thomas, uh, John Roberts, and uh, Alito, Samuel Alito. These are the four Supreme Court justices who voted for marriage, as you understand it, and to maintain the integrity of the home. Five to four, nine, nine people sitting up there in Washington, D.C., nine people, five of them have wiped away thousands of years, thousands of years of civilization and uh, replaced it with, with perversion. That's where it stands. Yes, sir. Justice Alito, <coughs> in the uh, Hobby Lobby case, his comments on that, he, he pointed out to uh, the Supreme Court that Jesus Christ is the one who came up with separation of church and state. And he said, you'll see the way 
Yes, he did, brother. He had a godless God. So Alito's come out a few times and has spoken the side of God, uh, and the other ones have not. Even John Roberts supported the, uh, you know, Obamacare. I know he did. He but supported he, that the other day. But Alito has come out strongly on the side of God. So yes. Yes. Uh, that's, uh, you know, that t it took the Lord to say something like that. Right. I mean, look how you can interpret that. Render to Caesar that which is Caesar's, and to God that which is God's. Who determines what belongs to Caesar? Yeah. Well, if you let Caesar do the determining, Caesar's going to take it all. Yeah. He's going to put you under the thumb, and he's going to rule over your life. And, of course, you know, you can get into a separate lesson than this. You go through the Bible and you'll find case after case after case where the people of God absolutely rebelled against the authority of the state and, uh, and said they served God. The apostles said plainly, we would serve God rather than men. Amen. In the book of Exodus, when they wanted to kill the, the, the Hebrew children, the males, they hid them. And then they came up with a little uh, twisting of the truth and said, well, the Hebrew women are lively. And when they come in to have their babies, they're already gone, and, and we can't kill the men, the, the man-child. Which, of course, was not, I don't know if it wasn't the truth. Maybe God did live them up. <laughs> Who knows? But I do know this. I do know that Moses was brought into this world, and Moses should have been killed. But what did they do with Moses? They hit him against the law. Pharaoh was the absolute monarch of Egypt. And that was, of course, against the law. Uh, so, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, here's what this begs. It begs the question, what does this lead to? We have two representatives here in the state of Tennessee, uh, Holt and, uh, I forget his name, the other one. He's a medical doctor. There are two young men. Uh, what was his name? I've got it here. I've got it in my notes. Uh, no, no. No. <laughs> Brian Terry and Andy Holt. Andy Holt be easy to remember. He used to be the president. Not this one, but that used to be the president of UT. All right. These two fine young men have introduced a bill that would uh, that would uh, that would that would protect ministers from performing same-sex marriages, which is it's a wonderful thing. Of course, it only applied to Tennessee, but this is the only place I marry people, <laughs> and that's I don't have to worry about the folks over in North Carolina. I hope they got somebody like that too, and on they go. But I'm glad we've got these two right here. They already had the bill drawn up. They were just waiting to see what the supreme the the Supreme Court did, and they brought it out. So uh, what I'm trying to tell you is, folks, that your government, the way it stands right now, 2015, has turned against you. It's turned against your Christian faith. The Bible is irrelevant. And it's, it's, what's left to be seen is this. And I'll put this out for you to think about it this morning. All right. Now we've got sodomite marriage in America. Do you know who all can perform a, a wedding? I don't know all, but I know a few. A ship's captain can. A justice of the peace can. A judge, I think, can. A, uh, uh, you know, other people, you know, they can be married. Of course, the chapels, they'll marry anything. They'll marry two dogs. <laughs> I'm serious. Wedding chapels, that's not a church, folks. No. I'm not saying all of them are like that, but, you know, many of them, it's about dollar bill. All right, here's the point. If two uh, gay people want to get married, then there's ample opportunity for them to get married, right? Okay? Therefore, if they come into the church of God and come up to a minister of Christ and try to force him to perform a same-sex marriage, what's going on? what's going on. And that should be obvious to anybody that that is a direct assault on the church. Yes, sir.
Yeah, that's a good point right there. I think I know where you're going. Yeah. So would they see the hypocrisy if you only come after the Christian pastor right. and not the Muslim Right, right, right. Well, they do. But they don't. I mean, he lives in La La Land. They just threw two more off of a building over here. And uh, they, uh, the Daily, the Daily, what, uh, UK, England has two papers that they publish all the time on the, on the internet, and they showed the photographs of them coming off of the building and, and three or 4,000 people standing down at the bottom, and they were homosexuals, and they threw them off of the building. This just happened two or three days ago. Under Sharia law, homosexuality is punishable by death. All right, but here, I thought your point was, would be this. Uh, if, if two gay people are going to come to a Christian pastor to marry them, why should they not go to a Muslim, whatever they call them, imam? And for, for a wedding, right? Right? Would the Muslim imam marry him? <laughs> yes, sir. Over there in uh, England and France, they have these uh, no-go cities. Well, oh, yeah, the area over there, yes. Come out there and kidnap children, little boys and girls, and use them for sex slaves. And not even the uh, British government will go into these cities to get them out. And they've been in there for some, some have been there for years. Well, our government is looking at passing a law to allow pedophilia in this country at a certain age to accommodate the Sierra law that they're trying to get passed in some cities. Well, see, the floodgate opens. And when the floodgate opens, you can't control everything that comes through it. Right. And this is what's happening. And it's coming. It's coming. Just like plural marriages and all the rest of the harems and the rest of it, that's coming. I mean, the, the Mormons have had a time with this anyway out there, and, uh, and they steal. Uh, this fellow Jeffers that they just locked up a couple of years ago, uh, he, had, uh, he had a harem. He had girls 12, 13, 14 years old, and uh, a bunch of them. And uh, what they're doing, of course, they'll tell you, well, we, we're, we are practicing the pure Mormon religion of uh, Brigham Young. Brigham Young had 53 wives, I think, last time I checked. It may be somewhere around in there. Yeah. They didn't tell me that in high school. What they taught me in high school was that Brigham Young led these people all the way from Elvira, New York, out west. They got Salt Lake City, Utah. They came out there to get away from persecution. And I don't believe in persecuting anybody, do you? But they came out there to get away from persecution and all that. And so he was, he was a pioneer, and he was in that sense. And in Salt Lake City, Utah, they, they built the Mormon Tabernacle. All that's true. But he had 53 wives, too. And that's a fact. Uh, and maybe the figure, I might be off on that figure, but it's in the 50s. That is a fact. And not only him, but the leadership of the Mormon church, and has for years. According to the, boss, uh, the Mormons, in order for you to be elevated into heaven, you have to have more wives and more children, and then anybody else in order to elevate yourself to the higher echelons in heaven. But anyway, of course, you know, this is plural marriages we're talking about, and uh, this is only one of the aspects of it, and it's coming. Now, here's another aspect you need to think about, and that is that the federal government has a, has a profound control over the education of America. And one of the greatest things that could ever happen to this country, it would be wonderful if it could ever happen to this nation, is to get the education of children out of the hands of the federal government and put it into the hands of the state. And even in, even in the local area, uh, education, to educate the children. Uh, because you, as you see right now, the federal government is corrupt to the core. And that reminds me, common core yeah. is another problem that's coming along right now. It's moving apace, and this thing's part of the one world government. But, you know, I mean, there's so many hot issues going on right now, you can't cover all of them. But the thing that's on the, f on the, on the front burner right now is what are they going to teach your children now? Are they going to bring in sodomites? And they're going to, are they going to come in there and give them demonstrations? Are they going to, what are they going to do? What kind of literature are they going to allow into the classroom? Because it is federal law now. And that's the problem. Yes, sir.
Yeah, that's plural marriages, yeah. Yeah, we're talking about that, yes. And there, well, of course, why not? I mean, if, you can, if, you, if two homosexuals can marry, why can't I have four or five wives, this guy says. I get real tired of that real fast. But the, you can't, what can you do about that? Now, here's, here's, here's another aspect of what you just said. If you legitimize, if you legitimize homosexual marriages, that means you have legitimized homosexuality. Right? I mean, really? All right. If you have legitimized homosexuality, that means that it is, it, there should be no reason why you can't, uh, 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 what's a good word for it? Uh, you know, show your affection in, in public. I'm sure there's a limit as to how far you can go. But, uh, I mean, since it's legitimized, it's, it's federal law now. It's the law of the land, they like to say. There's a lot of laws of the land that they don't, have any, that they don't pay any attention to. It's the law of the land if it, if it, it fits their agenda. You understand how the law of the land works. <laughs> but in any event, since it's legitimized, then there's no, nothing in the world wrong. If, like, for example, if, if two homosexuals come to temple, the doors are open. We don't ask anybody when they come through that back door what their, quote, quote sexual orientation is. I don't like that terminology, but for people that are politically correct, you know. Would, you know, by standing back there, sir, are you homo? You're not, <laughs> you're not allowed in here. No, just the opposite. We want them to come. Why? Because the gospel of Christ can save anybody. No, that's not an issue. That is a non-issue. If a, if a truckload of them pulls up out there in the parking lot and say, we're going to come to your service, you're going to stop us? No, sir, you come right in here, you sit right down, you're welcome. Come right on in. And then I'll open the book and start preaching the gospel. Amen. I don't know what message I might have had, but I know what I'd be preaching. <laughs> God can change your mind in a hurry. <laughs> Preach something relevant for the hour. <laughs> yes, sir. Preacher Blossom, don't you feel like that some of them are going to try to come into churches to get married just to see what if the preacher was? Absolutely. That's what we were talking about a few minutes ago. That's, that's why I said, as far as homosexuals are concerned today, they have many places they can go to to be married. All right? Many. I'm sure the federal government will set up all kinds of booths up and down the road and make sure that they're going to be able to get married. It's if they come into the church house and try to force a Christian pastor to do it, then there's a motive, agenda involved in that. See, yeah. I seen an article a couple days ago, the Unitarian Universalist Church down on Kingston Bible. Yeah. They've done to say that they don't want to. Well, sure. Well, I'm going to say, too, I'm going to say for anybody to hear it, homosexuals, lesbians are welcome at Temple Baptist Church. But they're not welcome to come in here and handle on each other, you know. You've got to be careful what kind of wording you use in here. They're going to have to behave themselves when they come into this house. But they are welcome to come in here and sit. I believe the gospel of Christ is more powerful than that spirit they can bring in here. I've seen it happen time and time again. Yes, sir. They're welcome. So therefore, they can't throw that at your face to say, well, we're not welcome. You are welcome. They're welcome. They're just not welcome to come in here and practice anything. They're not welcome to come in here and make a spectacle. They're not welcome to come in here and to try to, to try to take the service over, you know, or something like that. If it ever happened where they jumped up and started shouting, <coughs> screaming, and something like that to take the service over, I'd say, folks, let's stand up, sing Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, see you next week. And walk out the door. And if they want to stand in here by themselves and scream and shout, we'll call 911 and say, we got some crazy people over here. We've done let the church service out, and here they're standing in here screaming and shouting. That's the way to handle that bunch. Don't argue with them. You can't do that. Yes, sir. Yes, they did. Brother Romines was a good man, too. He did. Did he? Yeah, Brother Romines was a good man. I knew him for a long time. Bill Romines was a good man. Well, I'm saying, this is the new America, and this is what you know you might you might expect. And so the way to handle that is simple. They're welcome. Show them love and Christian compassion, and that's what you need to do. Show them love and Christian compassion, but they are not going to come in here and take over the service. Stand up, sing Amazing Grace, shake hands with each other, see you next Sunday. Walk out the back door.
And they'll know. They got the message. They'll get the message. They'll get the message. And walk out the back door, and when you get to the back door, say, Man, now go ahead and lock the doors. Turn the alarm on. <laughs> and then if anybody moves in here, the police will come. <laughs> Amen. There's a way to handle that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And it wars against the flesh. Yes, sir. In nature that we, like you said the other week, we have that fleshly mind which is against God. Right? But if I see it at the time that if it's that okay approval that people just uh, see that then they will begin to persecute events of what it leads to. Yes. Hating the life, hating the Christian. Right. The bigger, deeper thing, the satanic thing behind it for me is that. You have to show people love. You got to show them love, and and you, you have to love them. It changes not the overall satanic agenda behind. It. No, it doesn't. You have to sh you have to show them love, and they need love. They need to know that Christ died for them. He he died for everybody. He took that sin too yes. in his body yes. on the tree. He became sin for us who knew no sin. Right. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses from all Amen. sin. Amen. And so everybody's welcome to the house of God. Amen. As long as somebody wants to come in here and behave themselves, they're welcome. And they come in here hear the Word of God. But they're going to hear the Word. Amen. They're going to hear the Gospel. Amen. And it's going to get very uncomfortable for them. <laughs> but that's all right. That's okay. All right, we'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll start up in the service in a few minutes. Brother Crane, will you dismiss it?